Hey robot makers, have you heard of ROS, the robot operating system? Have you heard that it's complex and difficult to learn? I'm not so sure about that. It might be a bit easier than we think. So let's get started, shall we? Okay, so the session goals for today, we're going to be taking a look at ROS, version 2 of ROS, what it is and what it can do. So what is the robot operating system ROS? What are the goals of ROS? What's the bit of the background? What it can do? Why we would want to use it and make our projects maybe that little bit more complicated? And the kind of skill level and knowledge required. So what is ROS? So a definition from the wiki.ros.org, ROS is an open source meta operating system for your robot. It provides the services that you would expect from an operating system, including hardware abstraction, low level device control, implementation of commonly used functionality, message passing between processes and package management. It also provides tools and libraries for obtaining, building, writing and running code across multiple computers. So what does that actually mean? Let's just unpack that for a second. What's a meta operating system? So an operating system is software that runs on hardware platform and it enables users to write software without getting into the complexities of understanding how individual devices work. So you don't have to understand how a hard disk works if you're writing to a file. You just know that there is a concept of a file and you can write to it. So this is similar with ROS. The idea is that you don't have to get into the ins and outs of how to do message passing. You just know that you can use that as a service. So it's kind of a framework, uh, an abstraction of some of the complexities. So it provides services that you'd expect from an operating system. OK, hardware abstraction which is what we're just talking about. So you don't have to worry about the underlying operating system of the computer that you're running this on. You just need to know that you can use some of the services. So low level device control. So that means that we can write our own device drivers for things like range finders or lasers or motor drivers. Implementation, commonly used functionality, message passing. So we've looked at message passing in some of our videos previously. When we did the node red video, uh, we looked at using an MQTT broker to send messages on topics. ROS is very similar to that concept when it comes to message passing. We have topics, we have messages. It's just that those messages have a very specific format. We can use this very interchangeably between say Python and C++ without having to worry about that implementation. Uh, we don't even have to worry about what kind of computer this is running on either. And then package management. So when we write our code, we want to be able to share this code with other people so we can install it on other robots as well. It also provides tools and libraries for obtaining, building, writing and running code. So yes, it has a couple of libraries for helping us do things like writing the code. There is tools specifically around modeling, simulating your robot and to enable us to build and write code there are some templates and some commands that will build out all the, the files that we need uh, to make this work. So let's have a look at some of the goals for ROS. So it's all about sharing and collaboration. So the original inventors of ROS, which uh, let me just refer to my notes here, is Keenan Weirebeck and Eric Berger from Stanford University. Uh, they were really concerned about the amount of time spent reinventing the wheel versus new research. And they had a famous slide of, of lots of reinventing the wheel and a tiny bit of uh, new research going on. So they wanted to stop this from happening in the robotics era. If you think about the amount of times that people have created very similar kinds of code and frameworks. I mean, I've almost done the same thing myself, creating Smars Lab. I had message passing in there, message formats. I had process, inter-process communication between different parts of the robot. So they've looked at this and they thought enough is enough. So they want to make sure we can share code, we can collaborate without too much effort. They want it to be thin. So ROS is designed to be as thin as possible. Code written for ROS can be used with other robot software frameworks. It's very easy to integrate to other software frameworks as well. When they mean thin, it means there isn't lots of bloat around that. Your code is nice and efficient when you use ROS. ROS agnostic libraries. So the preferred development model is to write ROS agnostic libraries and clean functional interfaces. So all the way writing this for ROS, you should be able to use this code with other robotic frameworks as well. And there's also language independence. So ROS isn't tied to a specific implementation or language. So there are some implementations for Python, C++, Lisp, and there are some experimental libraries for Java and Lua as well. And it's designed to be easy to test. So one of the really great features we'll look at later on is that you can record some of the messages that get sent between nodes and then play them back. You can record them to something called the bag and then replay that bag. And this will really help when you're testing out your software. So you don't have to keep putting your robot in the exact same scenario scenario and test lots of different scenarios. You can record those scenarios and play them back later. So testing is really, really easy. And there's a unit called ROS test to help with that. And then finally scaling. So ROS is appropriate for very large runtime systems, and very large development processes, as well as quite small ones as well. So it's quite efficient. 
So let's have a look at some of the concepts. There's four main concepts. I don't think these hang together particularly well, but this is how it comes from the, uh, the wiki. So the first level is the ROS file system level, where all the files are. The ROS computational graph level, which is kind of a conceptual thing we'll have a look at in a minute. The ROS community level, and this is all about how we as a community share packages and communicate about that. And then there's something about naming conventions as well and the naming uh, system. So let's have a look at the file system first. So this is all about packages, meta packages, manifests, repositories, messages and service types. So packages is the unit for organizing software in ROS. A package contains a ROS runtime processes or nodes, a ROS dependent library, data sets, configuration files and anything else that we need to shove in there to make this thing work. A meta package is a specialized package that only serve to represent a group of related packages. Uh, and there's some kind of backwards compatibility with the first version of ROS. So ROS has gone through quite a few iterations. There's the original ROS and there's what we now use as ROS2. So I'm focusing here on ROS2. We then have package manifests or package.xml. So ROS makes quite a lot of use of XML. I'm not quite a big fan of this if I'm honest. XML is, is a bit yucky from a user point of view. It's very complicated. It looks like HTML with the sort of with the tags. You have to have an open tag and a closing tag and you have to match in a pair. Blech. Uh, but it uses them. I think they were quite trendy a while ago, XML. It's kind of gone out of favor now for things like YAML, which is a lot easier to uh, use. So this provides the metadata about the package, its name, version, description, license, information, any dependencies it has on other packages and any other information like exported packages. We get that created for us and then we can manage um, the contents of that quite easily within ROS. We then have the repository. So a collection of packages that share a common source code control system known as repositories, and they can be released together um, using the catkin release automation tool called bloom and uh, we'll look at some of these these tools in some future videos as well we then have messages message types so messages sent between nodes and the master or between nodes they will be sent on a topic so if this is for example we might have a motor node and we want to be able to send it a direction and a speed so we'll send it a message that contains what the speed should be we might send it a message that says turn it on or turn it off and they'll be on different topics so the actual type uh, is quite a low level thing it'll define what the type of message is is it you know a string of text is it a number is it a vector um, is it three vectors a vector three which is like an x y and z coordinate and so on so the data structure is defined within these messages so service types a service description stored in a package under that particular path we've got there so my package slash server slash my service types dot serve define the request and response types for data structures in ROS it's a bit of a wordy way of saying think about a web server when you open up a web page in a browser your browser is sending a request to a server and it's getting a response back which is the page so that's the kind of model there request and response and that's what services do they handle requests and responses okay so let's have a look at the next level this is a more interesting one i think the graph level so this is all about nodes the master parameter server messages topics services and the bags so nodes are the i'm going to read this out and then i'm going to show you this because it's a little bit heavy on the sort of conceptual side as you'd expect so nodes are processes that perform computation so you might have a node that just handles the motor driver so it will send and receive messages to do with the status of the the wheels maybe it's reading some um, encoder uh, or maybe it's being sent a message to, to turn the motor on at particular speed so nodes handle all that kind of stuff at a very specific level um, for a particular component so a robot control system usually comprises of many nodes the master is the ROS master that provides name registration and look up to the rest of the computational graph so this is the thing that orchestrates all the messages between the different nodes. Without the master, all bets are off, nothing will run. A parameter server is really just a database. It's a way of storing specific values so that when you start your robot up, it can check for those parameters, grab those parameters and load it into that node. So for example, if we had a speed that our motors should always turn at, we could have that as a default parameter called speed. And we can store that in our parameter server. It's a key value pair that can be grabbed and returned later on. So messages, nodes communicate with each other by passaging messages. A message is simply a data structure comprising of types of fields. Topics are messages are routed via a topic system with a publish and subscribe. So this is similar to MQTT. When we looked at Node Red, that, that very heavily uses that. And nodes send out messages by publishing to a given topic. 
I might publish to a motor topic and as a motor I might subscribe to that topic so any messages that are rooted to me will be rooted via that topic. Services are that different type of um, message passing so this is the request and reply it's done via services which is defined by a pair of message structures one for request and one for reply. A providing node offers a service under a name and a client uses that service by sending request messages and awaiting reply. And again this is quite like the World Wide Web where you, you have a browser that sends a request to the web server the web server then sends the page back and the reason we would use this over message passing with a publish and subscribe publish and subscribe is great if you want to be able to send a message and you you do that asynchronously you send a message and it'll get there at some point hopefully quite quickly whereas the service request and reply that's for more time critical ones so you want something to happen quite quickly so you, you send that off and it will get there right away and you'll get a response back to say that that happened. And bags, I always think of this is, it's just another way of describing a way to store some information. So a bag is a format for save, bag is a format for saving and playing back ROS message data. So bags are an important mechanism for storing data such as sensor data that can be difficult to collect but is necessary when developing and testing algorithms. So say we've got a rangefinder and we're trying to map out a room quite crudely with our rangefinder and we've got it on a server that's sweeping around. It might be really difficult to replicate that lots and lots of times so we could record it once and then we could try out different algorithms with that same set of data and what it does is essentially when you sweeping your sensor around on this servo you'll have an angle that you're sending that at you'll have um, responses back so you're measuring the distance and all that's happening um, against time so you've got a timeline you've got data points along that timeline and the bag can record all that information in real time and save it in a file format that can then be played back as if it was happening for real so really helpful when we're testing things out Okay, so let's have a look at this more visually, shall we? Because uh, some of that's quite text heavy, I think. So we'll start out with our master node. So when we start up our ROS environment, we're gonna start a master and this will be the thing that orchestrates all the message passing and so on. So we've got some nodes, they're gonna to connect to the master and we're also going to have some topics. So in this example, I've got direction and distance as two topics and we're, we're going to have a service as well so this could be um, a service for what would be really important stopping the robot if something happened we want to make sure we can quickly stop all the motors so we'll send a message there between one node and another node on a topic of direction and we have that publish and subscribe method and then we also might have a parameter server for saving out some parameters so it might be the starting position it might be a background color it could be all kinds of things it might be a message that gets uh, sent at startup we can save all those things in our parameter server and have them ready to go okay the community level so this is all about how we distribute our software how the repositories where we can find stuff the ros wiki tracking bugs ROS is an open source piece of software, so it's continually under development. There is always room for bugs to creep in there, so they've got a bug tracker to help squash that. There's a mailing list, and there's also a ROS Answers site where you can, a bit like, um, I'll say Reddit, more like Stack, Stack Overflow or whatever. And there is a blog as well. So let's have a look at some of these. Distributions. So ROS distributions are a collection of version stacks that you can install. A stack just means like a, a stack of software because it's just a bunch of scripts. Uh, distributions play a similar role in to Linux distributions they can make it easier to install a collection of software and they also make it maintaining a consistent version across a set of software so they name the versions of the ROS software um, so even though we're on version 2 there's kind of subsets within that uh, repositories so ROS relies on a federated network of code repositories where different institutions can develop and release their own software components so you might find I've just ordered a rangefinder um, which is one of those laser lidar spinning round things that can map out a room and uh, that actually comes with a package that that you can use uh, for ROS so it's kind of got all the definitions that you need and uh, understands how this thing works so we just connect it via serial as a serial node and ROS can do all its fancy stuff with that. The ROS wiki so this is where I've been reading some of this information from so the ROS community wiki is the main forum for documenting information about ROS anyone can sign up for an account and contribute with their own documentation provide corrections and updates write tutorials and more. The book ticketing system um, as you can see please see tickets for information about file tickets. So if you found a bug, you can raise a ticket and that will go to the person who manages that code. 
So the mailing list, um, this is the ROS user mailing list, is the primary communications channel about new updates to ROS, as well as a forum to ask questions about the ROS software. ROS Answers is a question and answer site for answering any ROS related questions. And the ROS.org blog provides regular updates, including photos and videos. So they'll have some uh, nice videos there of uh, real robots in action. So the last one names the graph package and code API. So naming conventions are really important. This is something that I came across when I was developing Smars Lab. I also didn't have naming conventions, so they've come across this. They've not reinvented the wheel. They've just come up with a really nice naming convention. Graph resource names provide a hierarchical naming structure that is used across all resources in a ROS computational graph, such as nodes, parameters, topics, and services. These names are really powerful in ROS and central to how larger and more complicated systems are composed in ROS. So it's critical to understand how these names work and how to, main, how to manipulate them. Package resource names are used in ROS with a file system level concept similar to the process of referring to files and data types on disk. So they have that sort of forward slash. Um, so the very root of the naming system is just a forward slash. And then from there you have sort of sub levels, a bit like folders. So the package resource names are very similar. They adjust the name of the package that is the resource that the resource is in plus the name of the resource for example the name standard messages slash string refers to the string message type in this standard message package and then finally the code api there are some standards within within ros for creating code and accessing ros features so if you're developing your own components and things um, you, you need to be aware of what the standards are just to make it interoperable with other people's code so if you like these videos, please make sure you like, comment and subscribe to the channel. That can really help me out and grow the channel. Quite a few people have said they really like this content and want to help out. So if you make sure you like the, the video, comment on the video, let me know what you think about it and subscribe, hit the little bell, make sure you've got all the notifications on there, then you'll get notified when a new video comes out. And I also do live streams every single Sunday at seven o'clock GMT ish. So we're in British summertime just about at the moment. So it's seven o'clock BST slash GMT, depending on that one hour time daylight savings. So make sure you try and join that if you can. Uh, really like to have you on the stream. You can ask questions directly uh, and interact with me live on the stream. So I thought I'd show you what ROS looks like. It doesn't have a fancy user interface or anything like that. It's more of an environment. So I've got Ubuntu installed on here. I've got Ubuntu 20.4.2 running on an ARM64 because it's the a Mac M1. And I've installed ROS using the tutorial from the ROS wiki. So let's open up a terminal. Um, I've also set the terminal so when it launches, it does this thing called sourcing. So it sets all the scripts up in advance and that means that we, we're ready to go. All the paths and everything are included in there. So I can do things like do ROS2. That's one of the main commands for interacting with the ROS master and we can do various different sub commands on there. So you can see that we can launch things, we can run things and so on. So if I run the simulator, so there's a, I've installed a turtle simulator, which is part of the, which is part of the tutorial. So first of all, we pick a package. So the turtle simulator is the package I'm going to run. And then within that, I'm going to run the turtle. So there we go. I've managed to find the right command. Um, so running the turtle simulator, we've got a little turtle in the middle of some space there. So I've opened up another terminal here. Now we can now type in ROS and then node. And we can see there that we've got one node running at the moment, which is the turtle simulator, which is what this blue screen here is. So I want to launch, I'm going to keep that open and I'm going to open up another terminal and we can have these actually running on separate computers completely and just use Wi-Fi or our local area network to connect to the various different nodes. So we're now going to interact with our turtle so we can launch another node which is the teleop node so let's just let's just run that so ros2 turtle sim which is the name of the package and then we're going to run the turtle there we go so what we've got going on here now um, if i just move this to one side but keep it as the active window i can now press these keys so um, it's all the keys that are around the f key make sure i've got that selected r our robot, our robot will rotate to the very top position. If I do V, it will rotate to the very bottom position. So it's all around the F key. And then if I go to the D key, then that's the left position. G is the rightmost position. T is the kind of one o'clock position. And X will be the opposite. I'm sorry, C will be the opposite of that as well. So this is just moving out our turtle around. And we can actually use the arrow keys as well and get it to sort of draw out um, some kind of line. Now I can record if I wish um, those those actions, those commands into the bag and then play them back to do some testing on later on. 
Now, if I go back to that other window and I do node list again, we'll see that we've got two nodes listed. We've got the teleop turtle and we have the turtle simulator. So the turtle, the turtle simulator is just pretending to be our robot and the teleop is sending that commands. So it's sending commands and we can have a look at what those actual nodes are, those topics are. So instead of doing node list, if we do topic list, we can see there that we've got parameter events, we have ROS out, we have turtle one command velocity, we have turtle one color sensor, and we have turtle one pose. So the command velocity is where we're sending these commands to. Now there is another command which is, so I'm jumping around a little bit here, uh, but I just want to kind of give you a flavor of some of the kind of things that this has. So we've got something called the RQT, and this is the ROS QT, is that the library that um, for drawing things on screen. So we can have a look here. We've got a little graph. If I make that full screen, we might be able to see this a bit easier. A little diagram on screen here, which has got our turtle command velocity. That's receiving messages from the teleop, which we understand, and it's sending messages to turtle sim. Turtle sim is then sending out messages to the turtle one rotate absolute action status topic. And we've got some other nodes as well over here. Okay, so I'm going to show you how we can uh, listen to some of those topic messages. So if we type in ROS2 topic echo, and then we type in the name of the topic that we're interested in. So if we go for turtle and then command velocity, and then we go back to our key thing here and we start typing in some actions for our robot to do. So let's, let's spin our robot round. And what we're going to do, let's just make him go back to the middle of the screen. And we can see there, we're actually getting the messages being sent. So if I go back to, let's try and get everything on screen here. If, if I now press um, the left arrow key, we can see there that the Z went to two for a second. If I press backwards, we can see the X went to minus two, minus two. If I rotate it again, the X is doing minus two and so on. So we can see there all these different messages, linear acceleration, angular velocity and so on. They're all being uh, captured by this little echo thing. So that's listening to the message broker and just echoing out to the screen. So let's just press uh, command C on that. We now press Q to quit on there. We can then have a look and see how many nodes we've got running. So let's go back to nodes and we can see we've just got the turtle simulator. And if we go back to that and we quit the turtle simulator, and then do list, there'll be nothing listed. So, so that's a quite a quick whistle stop tour. So I've installed uh, on my virtual machine Ubuntu. I've installed the ROS packages using the tutorial instructions. And then I've had a play around with the Turtle Simulator, which is kind of a nice gentle introduction to all the different concepts and topics for ROS. Um, a lot of people have said it's quite difficult to get into. I found this so far to be quite understandable, but I've built up quite a bit of knowledge based on some of the videos that we've done in the past. So if you've kept up with all the videos, you should also be able to get yourself working with ROS as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and this quite a brief introduction to ROS. I'll be building out some more shows on this in the future. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. And I shall see you for the next video. Bye for now.